live with a doctor. Featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians. Hosted by Dr. Gregory Leach and Jim York. Good evening. Welcome to Dialogue with the Doctor. We're here this evening with Dr. Raymond Phillips. He is a practicing gastroenterologist here in Naples, Florida. And he's been with us before more than once, and we're welcoming, welcoming him back. We're gonna, we, will be, we will be talking about um, constipation, which sounds like a simple thing, but it's not that simple, and we want to learn more about it from Dr. Phillips. Dr. Phillips, before we uh, get into it, I know you've been on the show before, but can you give us a little bit of your background? Oh, oh sure, I'd be happy to. Where your I just, offices are located? Yeah, sure. Uh, first, it's <coughs> important to know what a gastroenterologist is. A gastroenterologist is specifically trained in terms of digestive diseases, gastrointestinal ailments, as well as in the physiology of, of digestion. We're the only specialty trained in that. Uh, but to achieve that, you know, we, uh, uh, you go to college. I went to Princeton. Um, I went to medical school at Washington University in St. Louis. Did my internal medicine training at uh, Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia for three years. I spent a fourth year as chief resident there. I was selected for that. And then uh, I went through college on an ROTC scholarship and uh, went on active duty after um, training at Jefferson. Uh, and I was assigned to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for two years as an internist, uh, adult uh, medical doctor. And then I was selected for gastrointestinal training, a uh, gastroenterology fellowship, and was uh, trained at Walter Reed Army Medical Center for two years. And then I was on the staff at Walter Reed uh, for two years where I did research and I was assistant chief of the um, department uh, and as assistant professor of medicine and uniform services for health sciences. And then in the early 1990s, I came down here to, uh, to Naples to practice when I got out of the Army. And, and since then, um, our practice has grown. We have our main offices in uh, Naples and Goodlett Road. Uh, and our practice has grown to the extent that uh, Dr. Uh, Susan Liberski came to join us. Uh, and then uh, I also practiced with Dr. Neil Randall, Dr. Michael Marks, and Dr. Ahmed uh, Khatib. As I said, our main office is in Naples, but we also have satellite offices in Benita as well as uh, on Marco Island. So uh, yes, we're trying to serve the needs of Collier County and South Lee County <laughs> as far as the uh, gastrointestinal needs. Well, let's get into the topic of constipation, which I'm sure everyone has had one time or another, right? Well, constipation is really uh, uh, a universal experience for, for everybody uh, at some point in our lives. Uh, and, and typically it's defined as uh, uh, less frequent movements, uh, less frequently than desired. Sometimes difficult bowel movements or uh, difficult evacuations. And it's been studied very, very closely for men and women in terms of what's appropriate interval for frequency of, for women as well as men. Interestingly, most of these, stu these studies were done in England, uh, but they're applicable to the United States as well. Um, and um, with uh, Oprah's study, uh, show about four years ago about the uh, uh, description about stool and so forth, what's well, appropriate. Now, we, um, that highlighted a particular s a scale called the Bristol Stool Scale, which gives a description of appearance of stool. and. Uh, and uh, but suffice to say, with constipation, you know, it's a um, uh, it's a universal symptom, you know, and the perception of the need to evacuate or inability to evacuate or less than complete evacuation. But I got to tell you, there's a long history on issues of constipation in the United States. The United States and constipation are closely related, um, and you know, it, it dates back to the mid 1800s as the first reports of of um, public perception or discussion of constipation when uh, this Presbyterian minister named Sylvester Graham first sort of promoted the notion that constipation was as a consequence of a diminished fiber content in the American diet. And so he would go from city to city promoting a high fiber diet, talking about the virtues of fiber. Uh, every city he came to, though, all the butchers sort of would come up and riot and so forth. So he's banned from certain cities like Boston and so forth. Um, an interesting um, side note about constipation being uh, was he felt like constipation was the basis for sexual promiscuity. So the, um, and so he advocated a high fiber diet as a means to, to, to address that in American uh, psyche and nature. Um, he, he was a very influential speaker and he had, um, as a result of his speakings, uh, he attracted a number of disciples, if you will, 
uh, among them a person by name of John Kellogg and a guy, another individual by name of Post. And they, they attended his lectures and, and, they, um, and they embraced his notion. And they, each of them set out in their own fashion to develop a, an appropriate meal for the American family for breakfast. And, and Post developed, uh, uh, his initial product was called manna from heaven. Never sold. Um, but then he, uh, then they, his uh, marketing director renamed it Post Toasties, and it was just a, 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 a humdinger of success. And then Kellogg, he, uh, he had a product derived um, from flakes of corn and so forth. Tasted terrible. You know, sales were terrible. His brother suggested they add some sugar to it. Sales just escalated, and it went off the roof there, and they had quite a success for years and years. They never spoke to one another, though, because the adding sugar to the, the product made John Kellogg upset, so he never spoke to him again. Uh, at any rate, they both settled uh, and became bitter enemies in Battle Creek, Michigan. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Post, he died early, and his uh, daughter, Emily, went on to become a icon in American society in the early 1900s. So, um, but the, um, so there's been a close connection uh, uh, with the issue of uh, the American history and constipation. But it, it, it reached uh, great intensity in the, in the late 1800s because it was realized, and uh, that was the development of uh, the hypodermic needle. And initial studies where stool was extracted from mice, and, and that stool extract was injected back into the belly of a mouse, the mice would, uh, would keel over and die within a couple hours. So it was felt that there was toxins within the stool that needed to be evacuated on a regular basis in order to maintain health. Now that was disproven in the early 1900s with the advent of microbiological, microbiology and so forth. These were dying of overwhelming sepsis from, from injecting stool into their bloodstream. But nonetheless, the, the lingering notion of toxins in your stool you know, needing to be evacuated on a regular basis became embedded in American psyche. And so in the early 1900s, it was routine for American mothers to provide laxatives on a regular basis to their children so they would have regular evacuations or enemas, or enemas uh, as the case may be, so their children could uh, grow up and be healthy and not, and not be subjected to certain toxins as a result of uh, constipation. So, so and that, that concept nearly died out until the late uh, 1900s within the, uh, the advent of colonic cleansing uh, became a rose once more and interestingly was promoted by Princess Diana. Um, but that's, a, that's another story. What, what, I, m many of my patients who come in do not know what the word constipation means. Maybe you could define that. Because people, patients will come in and say, well, I, I'm constipated. And then I'll say, well, when was your last bowel movement? Well, it was two hours ago. Yet they're complaining about a sensation. So could, could you define for us or for our viewers so they know what well, yeah, that and, is? And, that, and that's really. an important question, Greg, because the, um, um, there can be an objective, uh, um, di uh, objective criteria in terms of frequency of movements. That is to say, if you have, um, and as I said, I alluded to a moment ago, is that for men and women, there have been systematic studies to show what's normal for women. Uh, typically, a movement a day is normal for a woman, uh, five to seven movements per week. Uh, for men, it's two to three per day, uh, or, or as few as three per week. But that's a numerical definition. You can also have um, uh, meet the criteria of constipation with the sensation of, of incomplete evacuation or the urge to evacuate but not successful evacuation. And, and so an individual may be evacuating on a regular basis but still have the perception that somehow they're uncomfortable or they, they need to evacuate. So it just, the, um, it, it can be a little bit imprecise and it's important when discussing this to really clarify exactly what the symptom that's being uh, under and not just assume that, um, that it refers to infrequent movements. Uh, and in, for example, an individual may have regular evacuations each day, but if the movement is particularly difficult to evacuate or hard, you know, they, they, they may be very uncomfortable with that. And, and as a result, that needs to be addressed. Now, you might say, well, how would you address that? Well, 
and why does it occur? And there are a number of different factors that can you know, lead to um, uh, difficulties. You know, a diminished fluid intake, for example, or diminished fiber intake, as we were referring to a moment ago. I should say Sylvester Graham, he developed the Graham cracker, uh, which, was a, which was a great success as well, and his effort and his contribution toward uh, contributing to a higher fiber diet uh, for the American population. But a higher fiber diet and increased fluid intake will help many people, but in, in some individuals, you know, that will not make a difference because you know, there are some individuals where they can have an alteration in the normal peristalsis to normal motility, the normal contractions within the GI tract, such that you know, they, they don't necessarily have regular or predictable evacuations. And as a result, the longer material resides within the colon, more fluid is extracted from that material, and, and the stools become harder, more compact, and more difficult to evacuate. So in the last 50 years, um, the, uh, and the issue of therapy for constipation has been very neglected. Uh, laxatives from years and years ago and are still used used on a routine basis, milk of magnesia, for example, or, or different types of stimulant laxatives like Cascara or Senna. Uh, Senna now has made a comeback. Formerly, it was popular in the form of Sinicot, but now it's been included in a number of herbal teas now, uh, and it it's comes under the name Senna, S-E-N-N-A, -N -N uh, and it's promoted as an herbal tea, uh, but it is a stimulant laxative. And the, in an effort to uh, be more systematic and sort of addressing this need in the American public, a number of new laxatives now in the last 10 years now have, have been researched and, uh, and shown to be effective and available uh, for, uh, for use. Uh, and, and, and they are very, very useful. But before you start turning your attention to laxatives, you know, the, the basic things are important to do in terms of an adequate fluid intake, an adequate um, fiber intake. Uh, and, and fluid intake is, is very individual. It depends on the environment you're in and your body size and your activity and so forth. Um, and, and for example, in Florida, most people are dehydrated, so it's important to get a greater quantity of fluids than it would be if you're living in a, in a cooler climate. The, um, and fiber content is, is, a, um, is a little bit um, vague. Uh, but generally, uh, what is recommended uh, by the FDA now is five to seven servings of fruit and vegetables a day uh, as a way of trying to achieve that. Yes, indeed, you can take fiber supplements in forms of different varieties like Citrusel or Metamuse or Fibrocon, but it's, it's so much more interesting to eat your food <laughs> than, than to take a tablet. And so the, the preference would be to, to meet those requirements of fiber intake through eating more fruit and vegetables. Um, but yeah, there's just an occasional individual that despite everything you do, uh, you need to turn your attention uh, toward uh, other interventions. Now, it's important to understand, if, if someone uh, has uh, constipation and it's a new finding, it really does need to, to be evaluated by a physician to be clear that it's not it's something substantial in terms of a developing obstruction or blockage from, from something more serious like a tumor or cancer. Um, but in general, individuals who have had difficulties with constipation, it's oftentimes been a long-standing uh, experience and not, not a short-term one. Finally, I shouldn't neglect that many, many different medications now will affect, I, um, will affect uh, uh, and promote constipation. And it's, it's a consequence of some of our success with these different medications that we use for different conditions. Uh, it can affect the gastrointestinal system and, and diminish how readily and how rapidly the muscles that line the gastrointestinal system work in terms of regulation. So for example, there's medications that help uh, reduce the urgency in terms of urinary urgencies that many people will have um, who have an enlarged prostate, for example. But that same medication also diminishes uh, the gastrointestinal system's ability to, uh, of the muscles to work efficiently, and that can promote constipation. 
Well, we're going to take a short break okay. and come back and talk more about some of the medications uh, for constipation or at least even other treatments for constipation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting topic. We'll Explo be right back in an just exploding just, field, if you will. <laughs> okay. We'll be back in just a moment. emergency happened right now, you can have help with the push of a button with Medical Alert. Remember when I took that fall, Mary? Oh, yes, that was terrible. Yes, it was. Help! And I thought, what if you hadn't been there? I ordered my Medical Alert the next day. I can't describe how safe I feel now with my Medical Alert. You didn't know I was wearing it, did you? Medical Alert is easy to install, waterproof, and covers you inside your home and out. It helps me feel safe from fires, break-ins. And of course, a medical alert. And if you don't have a home phone, don't worry. They have that covered. There's always help at the push of a button. Don't wait till you need it. Get Medical Alert for less than a dollar a day. There are no long-term contracts. Order now and get your second button free. Call for your free brochure. For your complete medical alert system with second button free, call 800-604-2791. Welcome back to our show, Dialogue with the Doctor. We are here this evening with Dr. Raymond Phillips, a practicing uh, gastroenterology specialist from Naples, and I'm here with Jim York. And we've been talking about constipation, uh, which in a way, is an interesting subject because not much is known about it, and so we're learning more about it today. But we're going to talk more about medication treatment. Well, exactly, and, and I should preface this by saying that the um, it's important if you have a new onset of constipation or change in bowel habits associated with that, uh, be it constipation as we defined earlier as a sensation of evacuating or, or difficult evacuation, frequent evacuation. Yeah, that does deserve medical attention and evaluation. Uh, but you know, assuming that, hey, that medical evaluation now has been done and there's no sign of any kind of uh, blockage or narrowing and, and an individual has made an effort to increase the, the fluid content of their diet, the dietary content um, in terms of fiber uh, by eating the fruit and vegetables and so forth. And then also, as we were saying a moment ago, uh, being, uh, you know, re-examining the medications that are being used to be confident that they're not provoking uh, constipation. Just as an aside, many pain medications now are all constipating. And, well, they've always been throughout history, um, but with the availability of these medications and used more broadly in the last 15 years, it's become clear that, you know, pain medications are, and I'm talking now in particular, the ones that are opioid-based. Um, will, will promote uh, and provoke uh, constipation. But now there are, in the last 10 years now, uh, there have become available a number of different medications that are very effective for, uh, for treatment of, of constipation. Uh, one of them is a, um, it's, it's called Miralax, uh, and it's a medication that comes in a powder form, but it, it's, it's interesting because it's not a powder like you might think of in terms of a fiber additive. It's actually polyethylene glycol. You know that ethylene glycol that you studied in, in uh, high school, which is antifreeze, basically. Uh, but by taking ethylene glycol antifreeze and constructing a large molecule made up of thousands of individual molecules, it's extremely safe. You're not going to poison anybody by taking it's this. It's a polymer? It's a, it's a large polymer. That's the formal name for a, a large uh, molecule that's been uh, comprised of many, many smaller molecules. And, and um, the nature of that is, though, is that when you t add this to fluid, it prevents that fluid from being absorbed into the bloodstream. So when you add this powder to eight ounces of fluid and drink it, within a day or so, eight ounces comes out the other end. So it maintains a certain level of fluid within your gastrointestinal system, which is it was quite remarkable because your whole gastrointestinal system is designed to absorb fluid, uh, as to extract fluid. And to be able to that and to counteract that tendency is quite effective. Uh, it's quite remarkable. But by maintaining that fluid in your GI tract, that maintains a certain volume of material within your colon. That, in turn, distends the colon, stimulates it to contract, and that, that stimulation to contract is what sort of propels things through your system and allows an evacuation. 
Now, other, uh, and this is an area of tremendous research, other drugs now have become available. Amitizo is another, Lenzis is another. These are drugs that um, uh, stimulate fluid production, fluid release within the gastrointestinal system, and that fluid release then in turn accumulates a certain amount of fluid within the, the colon and, and stimulates it in the way I've just described. Is that prescription only? These drugs are prescription. Now, Miralax is available over the counter, mm -hmm. uh, does not require prescription. These other two drugs that I'm describing to you are, are prescription items. And, and so it's important to consult with your physician. You have to be careful that you're not, you don't get dehydrated when you're doing this? Or well, no? these are drugs that can have that potential side effect mm -hmm. in terms of if used excessively, it, you can cause a loss of, of fluids that can dehydrate you. And, um, but as I said a moment ago, it, it's important, and that's a fundamental issue that needs to be addressed first mm -hmm. um, before turning our attention toward pharmacological therapy with medications to treat this. But the exciting thing about these newer therapies is that they are extremely effective. <laughs> They're extremely effective and the risk profile, the side effect profile is very, very good. And uh, other than the cost, which is substantial, <laughs> they, uh, they, they, they seem to have a great uh, benefit and are very effective in a short-term uh, in a short-term fashion. Now, none of these drugs uh, have necessarily been looked at on a long-term basis. The only one that has had long-term studies is Miralax, and that those studies have gone up to one year in duration. And even at that point, it's still effective and and appears to be uh, continues to be safe. Uh, these other drugs that I've mentioned, though, don't have long-term studies to give you a, a sort of a um, um, uh, you know, confidence that you can use this on an ongoing basis. And of course, none of these drugs have necessarily been uh, well studied in, in children or, or pregnancy, so it's a little bit difficult there. Pregnancy, routinely you become constipated, and that's uh, associated with a change in sort of hormonal balance. Uh, and children, you know, for a variety of reasons, can sometimes be constipated given the sort of the regimen and nature of um, you know, children going to school and so forth, uh, it, uh, that can, uh, there, you can promote constipation in that context. So if you were to, getting back just to the beginning of your conversation about um, patients sometimes talking about ridding the body of toxins and evacuating the colon in order to do that, and that, that conception came from that, or that original piece of information that you talked to us about. Correct. Uh, but that sense has been proven not really to be correct. Yet this practice is stronger today than it was to me even 15 or 20 years ago yeah, for this yeah. concept. Yeah. And it continues to be, uh, show up again and again in different, um, uh, different um, um, individuals, celebrities, tend to promote this concept, uh, and it, it really is a false concept. That is to say that there are toxins within the colon that need to be evacuated. Your gastrointestinal system is very effective as far as uh, handling any toxins, evacuating any toxins. Granted, if you're not evacuating on a regular basis and you're constipated, you can get retention of gas and stool that can make you uncomfortable but there is no release of any toxins into your bloodstream uh, that will affect your overall health. However, some individuals in particular who have agendas with regard to dietary interventions will, will promote the notion, you know, will promote the notion that somehow um, that uh, certain foods will linger and reside within the gastrointestinal system and colon and lead to um, for years, uh, yeah, and, and where these, does that come these from? very vivid images of putrefaction, uh, of rotting flesh inside of your colon, of uh, protein in particular, leading to toxin release is is just not accurate at all, uh, and just uh, a false science altogether. But has been used to promote these practices of colon cleansings, of cleanses of various sorts, either through enema or oral preparations with the notion that somehow you will be healthier 
as a result of, 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 of pursuing these interventions. But we, we know that when you increase throughput or have diarrhea, you, you will lose electrolyte, you lose, well, you can tell me what you'd lose, sodium, potassium, chloride. So in theory, you can lose those things. What else is there to lose? That, I'm just trying to get at this subject, you know. It's yeah. Well, this is, this is an important subject because, um, well, for example, if you go to these, uh, these, you get, uh, these different therapies, colon cleansings, mm -hmm. you know, certainly you're going to lose money out of your pocket, all right, you know, because they're not giving this stuff away. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have individuals that are being, uh, receiving uh, either laxatives of various sorts in an unsupervised fashion, you can lose great quantities of fluid, sometimes potassium, and that, can, uh, uh, that loss of potassium can sometimes cause a number of other symptoms like cramping, irritability of your heart, uh, and, and leading to irregular heart rhythms. You know, and, and that's part of the reason you know, why uh, anorexics who purge will sometimes die as a result of taking various laxatives because of alteration in their potassium level that causes an irritability to the heart. That's how Karen Carpenter died yes. years ago. So it, it's, it's a circumstance where you can have real consequences of, and real side effects of, of pursuing therapy in an effort to pursue good health. Uh, and so it, that's, the, that's not even talking about the mechanical effects of some of these colon in, in, uh, these enemas, that is to say, administration of fluid into the colon to evacuate the colon. Sometimes that can even lead to damage to the colon or, or mm -hmm. perforation of the colon itself, which can be dangerous. Uh, and life-threatening. So the, the, there are consequences to pursuing uh, therapy like this that's not approved. And, and as a result, you know, we're encouraging people, particularly now since we have effective therapy, we have a good understanding about the nature of constipation, that yeah, you should see a physician and be evaluated and have some, uh, develop a plan of, of action uh, as far as an ongoing um, uh, approach to this. And it doesn't necessarily involve taking medications. As we talked about, there's much you can do on your own that doesn't uh, require medications. But it does require a thoughtful approach uh, to the extent of and, and not being frightened into pursuing um, you know, expensive therapy that's not going to really benefit you at all and potentially can have a lot of side effects. So eat real food, but if that doesn't work, see your doctor. Well, do what your mother told you to do. Eat your fruit and vegetables and drink plenty of fluids. And that, that's a good start. So that's a great start in terms of being able to you know, have a healthy, uh, healthy lifestyle and, and, and be more comfortable. Thank you for coming. Yeah, we want to thank you uh, again. You're welcome. You're welcome. Learned thanks. a lot once again. Uh, well, thanks. And we do want you to come back. Oh, I'd be happy to. <laughs> thank you for being with us.